So good morning, everyone. On behalf of the 495 Metro West Partnership and the Middlesex 3 Coalition, I want to thank you for joining us for this morning's special presentation regarding the draft guidance for multifamily zoning requirements for MBTA communities. Before we introduce our presenters this morning and kick off our program, I'm going to go over some housekeeping items briefly. All attendees are muted during today's session. Following the presentation, we will invite you to ask questions of our presenters by typing your questions into the chat or Q&A functions of our Zoom room today. I will moderate the Q&A portion by selecting questions from the chat and reading them aloud to our presenters. Please note, of course, that any questions which are disrespectful will not be asked and questions which are overly lengthy may be shortened in the interest of time. We're at one hour for our session this morning. Should you experience any technical problems during the session, our immediate guidance would be to log out and then log back in. Should you need further assistance, the Partnerships Manager of Policy and Planning, Jeremy Thompson, is available to assist you and can be reached via email at jeremy at 495partnership.org. Finally, please note that today's session is being recorded for later posting on our website, 495partnership.org. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to my colleague, Stephanie Cronin, Executive Director of our neighboring Middlesex 3 Coalition, our co-host this morning, for some words of welcome. Go ahead, Stephanie. Thank you, Jason. As most of you may know, the 495 Partnership and the Middlesex 3 Coalition were both public-private partnerships. We serve neighboring regions and we have many common goals, strengths, and challenges. So it makes sense that we work together to improve economic development in the area. Um, both organizations pursue economic development through advocacy on critical infrastructure and transportation matters, real estate and housing development, connecting employers to resources, and bringing together policymakers and businesses to advance our region's interests. We're going to pop some information into the chat box about our two organizations, and, and we ask you to do the same. We'd love to know who's joining us this morning, so we invite you please to use the chat box to introduce yourselves, your name, your title, your organization. Um, and with that, um, we're very excited to learn more about this key component of the housing choice legislation, so I'm going to turn it back over to Jason for introductions and to start today's meeting. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Stephanie. Enacted as part of the Economic Development Bill in January 2021, state law now requires that any MBTA community shall have at least one zoning district of reasonable size in which multifamily housing is permitted as of right. In December, DHCD released draft guidelines for MBTA communities regarding these new multifamily zoning requirements. We will hear this morning from Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Mike Keneally, as well as representatives from DHCD and the Massachusetts Housing Partnership about the new guidance. Leading our presentation this morning will be uh, Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Mike Keneally. Secretary Keneally advances the Baker Polito's administration, um, administration's agenda to create economic opportunity and new housing for residents. He leads the administration's efforts to strengthen Massachusetts's leadership in the innovation economy while overseeing significant investments in affordable housing. Secretary Keneally combines a successful track record in business with a strong commitment to public service. After a career in private equity, the secretary spent two years as special advisor to the receiver at Lawrence Public Schools, working with the state appointed superintendent receiver on the school district's turnaround plan. Prior to joining Governor Baker's cabinet as secretary at the end of 2018, Secretary Keneally served as assistant secretary for business growth at EOHED beginning in 2015, playing an integral role in advancing the administration's strategy for job creation and business development. Secretary and his family live in Lexington, which is, of course, a Middlesex 3 coalition community. He received a degree in government from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Harvard Business School. And with that, welcome to Secretary Keneally. I will turn the presentation over to you. Well, uh, Jason and Stephanie, thank you so much for having us on this morning and bringing the group together to talk about this uh, uh, very timely and important topic. Uh, joined today by Clark Ziegler, who runs the Mass Housing Partnership, uh, Chris Kletchman from, our, uh, from DHCD, and Roy O'Hanlon, who's our legislative director. Uh, in the executive office. We're going to run through a, a presentation deck and then um, and then Clark and Chris and Rory will be available for your questions uh, after we go through the deck. So let's uh, let's kick it off. So today's topic, new multifamily uh, zoning requirement for MBTA communities. As Jason mentioned, this is part of the economic development bill passed by the legislature and signed by the governor in, uh, in January of last year. Next. You know, when we talk about housing in Massachusetts, we always start with the level of housing production in the Commonwealth. And worth noting that uh, between 1960 and 1990, the state permitted about 900,000 new housing units. And from 1990 till today, it's about half that. And so in a single generation of Massachusetts, we cut in half our level of housing production at a time when our economy grew and our population grew. And 
supply and demand being what it is, well, falling supply and rising demand means, means rising prices and a housing crisis, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But we think today that we're short about 200,000 housing units statewide. And obviously our cities and towns play a key role uh, through your role in zoning and permitting and determining what housing gets built. So this is, a, I think, a good place to start for context of this new law, which is the level of housing production in the state and the need to produce a lot more housing. Next. I always say we've been using the term uh, housing crisis in our team uh, for a long time now, long before we ever heard of COVID-19. I think in a lot of ways, the pandemic has shown a brighter spotlight on some of these challenges, but we've had a challenge now for a long time to create adequate housing for our young families, our workers, an aging population, uh, back to supply and demand. We have today among the highest and fastest growing home prices and rents of any state in the country. And obviously this has a dramatic impact on our households and their ability to pay for housing. Uh, it's got a big impact on, on our communities. I spent a big part of my job traveling the state, talking to local leaders. And when they talk about their aspirations for their city or town, uh, the lack of housing production is an impediment in a lot of cases. And very meaningfully, it impacts the state's ability to compete economically. You know, we're in a world now where talent is just a lot more mobile than it ever was before. And we think about, you know, we want people to think about making their life, making their career here in Massachusetts. Our very high housing costs is a competitive disadvantage as we compete for jobs and opportunity, especially now that talent is a lot more mobile. Next. Um, confronting the housing crisis has been a key uh, initiative of Governor Baker since the start of the administration. We've done a number of things as an administration to try to tackle this crisis. I'll highlight a few things here. Uh, the governor signed the largest housing bond bill in the state's history in 2018, $1.8 billion of which we've invested about $1.4 billion so far to create about 20,000 affordable units around the state. Uh, the economic development bill, in addition to uh, having the multifamily zoning requirement, has a number of important capital authorizations to create more housing near public transit around neighborhood stabilization and climate resilient affordable housing production. It also very meaningfully included the housing choice zoning reforms. And I'm sure folks know the background on this one, but it was literally a 100 year old law that said that every, every rezoning is a local decision that requires a two thirds vote of city council or town meeting. Well, Housing Choice took that two thirds down to a simple majority for about eight different types of housing best practices. Very important reform. Uh, more recently, the ARPA spending package, the uh, spending some of the state's money that received from the American Rescue Plan Act has more money for housing production. And I always like to make note of the eviction diversion initiative, great initiative by our DHCD team. Uh, to keep people housed during the pandemic. So we've done, I think, the things that state government can and should do to address the housing crisis, but so much of the challenge is around freeing up the market and getting more housing produced statewide. Next. Uh, I think of all the things we can get done in housing, uh, getting more housing near public transit is a very meaningful thing to do. I always say that, that TOD is, is good housing policy, good transit policy, good climate policy in good local economic development policy. There's a lot of good that comes with having more housing near public transit, better access to places people go every day, um, work and services and other destinations, getting uh, single occupancy cars off the road, re-enlivening our downtowns. There's a lot of good that comes from TOD. And we got a long way to go on this one. Clark and his team did some great analysis on the degree to which we have housing near public transit. Uh, the answer is not that much. It varies a lot around the state, but on average, the median housing density is six homes per acre near public transit. And if we simply uh, got that very low six up to a, I think an equally modest, not equally, but a, a, a very still modest level of 10, that's another 253,000 housing units. So we got a ways to go on this one. It's a real opportunity for the state. Next. So what are we talking about today? Uh, well, you know, when the governor signed this uh, a little over a year ago, uh, he made it clear that the administration would take a thoughtful approach to developing uh, the compliance criteria of the new law. And so the draft guidelines released back in uh, on December 15th of last year are, in our view, consistent with the underlying law. Uh, they focus solely on zoning, the local rules that govern where housing can be built. Uh, they're meant to recognize that a multifamily district that is reasonable in one city or town uh, may not be reasonable in another. Uh, and they do provide for and preserve local control. Cities and towns will have discretion on where these districts are located. And we think this has enormous potential. We're pleased to present the draft guidelines to you today and, and hear what questions and comments you might have. Next. So what are we not discussing today or what are the guidelines of the statute not do 
Uh, this is an important point. I want to spend some time on this one. Uh, this law and the guidelines are not in any way a mandate to produce housing. And I would say we've done, I think this is uh, session number 19 we've done around the state with, with a variety of groups. And I would say the vast majority of any of the concerns we heard, vast majority, probably being like 80 or 90%, are as if this were a production mandate. And so this is all about the zoning, getting the zoning in place for multifamily housing near public transit. It, there's not a requirement to build any number of units. This has nothing to do, for example, with Chapter 40B or any particular projects. Um, it's all about the zoning. And we recognize uh, that the actual production of housing is going to depend on a lot of factors. The zoning is just foundational. You need that in place. Uh, but the actual production of housing depends on developer interest, depends on infrastructure like water and sewer, depends on market dynamics, and it will take time. But this is all about getting the zoning in place that might facilitate that development sometime down the line. <clears throat> Next. So on this, um, on this page is literally the entire statute. I think it's worth uh, talking about this because you know, the legislature passed this, the governor signed it. So what's in law is what's on the page here. And then we are charged with developing the compliance guidelines that determine if a community is in compliance or not. So we'll spend a few minutes on this one. Uh, and it says simply that an MBTA community, that is also defined in statute, we'll talk about that, uh, shall have a zoning ordinance or bylaw that provides for at least one district of quote, reasonable size. And I think a lot of our efforts have been around this notion of reasonable size and what that means. And Chris and Clark can take us through those details uh, in which multifamily housing is permitted as a right. And this housing has to be without age restrictions. It's gotta have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre. Uh, and where applicable will be located not less than, <clears throat> sorry, not more than half a mile from public transit. So this is the, this is the, the key stuff that's in the law the 15 units per acre, uh, the no age restrictions, and then it applies to MBTA communities. Um, and it is a mandate. It's got the word shall in there. We've gotten a lot of questions about that. You know, what is this? Is it a mandate? Is it an incentive? Uh, it's a legisl legislatively prescribed mandate. That, that's where the word shall comes in. Um, it goes on to say that an MBTA community that does not comply is not eligible for certain funds uh, from our capital programs. And then it charges the department, that's DHCD, uh, to consult with the MBTA and MassDOT to come up with the guidelines that determine if a community is in compliance or not. So I think it's good to start the discussion with, with what is in the statute and then it was up to us, uh, is up to us to figure out what the compliance guidelines look like. Next. And of course, an MBTA community is also defined in law. There's 175 communities subject to the new law uh, and there's a uh, uh, picture here on the map in front of us. Next. I think now it's over to Chris to talk about reasonable size and the other uh, more detailed aspects of the guidelines. Thank you so much, Secretary Keneally. Uh, it's great to be in front of everybody again, um, maybe soon in, in person. Um, just picking up where the Secretary left off, uh, folks may recall that about a year ago when this bill was signed, it actually went into effect immediately. And very soon after that, we issued some guidance that said, hey, communities that, you know, we, we, communities don't have a time to comply until we produce guidelines uh, and compliance criteria. So everybody was uh, eligible for the grants last year. Um, but now, in fact, we have the compliance criteria out for public comment. Um, and there are some requirements for these MBTA communities. So I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna start with talking about reasonable size. And we have a two prong test um, outlined in the guidelines uh, about reasonable size. First is a minimum land area and that there must be a 50 acre, the district must be at least 50 acres of land and that's in total. And that 50 acres has to have that minimum gross density of 15 units per acre. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how that 50 acres does not have to be a uniform block that's all contiguous, that it can be actually broken up across the community. But I'll get to that in a little bit uh, later slide. And then we've put forward the concept of a minimum multifamily unit capacity. And this is a required uh, amount of multifamily housing that the zoning needs to, be, needs to show that it has the capacity for. As the secretary said, these are not actual units that are gonna be built, but we are looking for communities to show us how their zoning district um, can allow for a certain amount of multifamily housing. And the chart on the bottom here lays out the framework that we established, which is four different kinds of transit communities. Um, starting with subway light rail communities, bus communities, commuter rail communities, and then adjacent communities. And there are some of the 175, in fact, many of the 175 do not actually receive uh, or have a transit station uh, from the MBTA. 
the percentage, um, the, and so those four uh, transit types have an allocated percentage of their existing housing stock um, to get to derive this minimum unit capacity number. And it kind of common sense, the more intense the transit is, the higher the percentage is. So the subway starting at 25% of the every, every community's 2020 housing stock uh, and down to 10% for adjacent communities. Um, these numbers are from actual, you know, what exists now, uh, and so they're not taken from thin air um, uh, and, and, you know, are kind of realistic numbers um, for these uh, transit types. And then the last column of, uh, just shows the distribution of the number of communities. Um, and again, as you can see, many of the 175 are commuter rail or adjacent. Uh, let's have the next slide, Rory. So for me, it helps to look at this on a map. Uh, and this is the map that shows um, where those transit types are by, the, um, uh, by community. And you can see the dark blue is subway or light rail. The lighter blue is bus, uh, commuter rail, and MBTA adjacent. And so you can kind of start to see the commuter rail lines extending out. And this, uh, uh, these transit categories were derived based on existing service in a community, or if you have a station within a half mile of your community boundaries. Just for example, um, the town of Southboro has a commuter rail station and Hopkinton does not, um, but Hopkinton is within, you know, the station in Southboro is right on the southern border and is within a half mile of Hopkinton. And so Hopkinton gets assigned as a commuter rail community uh, because of that half mile uh, proximity to the transit. Uh, next slide. So let's just kind of talk a little bit more about this uh, minimum unit capacity and how does it play out? And let's pretend that we had four communities and they each had 10,000 housing units uh, in you know, each one of them in one of these communities. So if you were a subway community and you had 10,000 housing units, the minimum capacity for multifamily housing that the zoning district should show would be 2,500. Uh, for bus communities, that would be 2,000, commuter rail communities, 1,500, et cetera. So it's pretty straightforward math. We do have a chart um, on our website, mass.gov backslash MBTA communities, um, that gives us uh, the actual uh, multi capacity for multifamily housing for all of the 175. So again, as the secretary said, this is really about showing that the zoning is setting the table, so to speak, to allow for this capacity. The One of the main effects of this new statute is to remove the barrier um, in many communities of not having any multifamily housing uh, available. And so this um, allows for setting the table with the zoning, but is not about the production of housing units. Next slide. So uh, in addition to the reasonable size, um, the, you, there is this requirement for 15 units per acre uh, that averages out across the multifamily district. So the unit capacity is one part of that, but then there is this uh, density requirement. And so um, when you look at that 10%, especially for our smaller communities, um, there is actually a different floor than 10%. There is a floor of 750 unit capacity. Uh, and that's because if you have a minimum land area of 50 acres and a minimum density of 15 acres, that's 700, a minimum of 750 acres. And um, in the draft guidelines, the zoning district has to pass both tests. And so that's the reason why that 750 units is the minimum floor for all communities um, as presented in the draft guidelines. And I'm sure we, we may have, some, we've had several questions about that and we may talk about that in the Q&A session. Uh, next slide. So we talked about the location uh, and um, you know, we do believe that there's some flexibility built in um, about how and where um, the district is located. Uh, and so just to recap, and again, there are some, because um, there are different types of communities, those that have a station within their boundaries and those that don't, um, the first is if we, we have a kind of slightly different um, locational criteria. So if you have a station in your community uh, or land within a half mile of a transit station, the guidelines articulate that at least half of the multifamily zoning district has to be within that half mile area. Um, and we do provide for some exceptions uh, for unusual cases. We are certainly aware there are some uh, stations that are right next to water, water, very large water bodies or next to a, a freeway or a highway. Uh, and so there are some, you know, uh, unusual uh, situations. But so the um, locational criteria allow for, again, 
less than, not all of the, the district has to be within that half mile. And in fact, we go further to say that you can break down um, the district into chunks of um, 25 acres. So at least one portion of the multifamily district has to be 25 contiguous acres, but then we allow for um, at, down to five acre uh, areas that could be part of the district. Uh, and that's giving that location for communities to apply the, the district um, in a variety of different locations uh, in, their, uh, in their community. The statute, as you saw, because we went through it, um, is not specific and has no locational direction if a community does not have a station within its boundaries. And so the guidelines establish that, that uh, in, in that case, that the district should be located with reasonable access to a transit station if that exists. And that's really referring to tra uh, good transportation connections, whether it be by car or bike or, uh, or, or walking. Um, it may also be uh, along a bus route from another Regional Transportation Authority. So many of the communities receive service from like a Lowell Regional Transit Authority, Merrimack Valley Transit Authority, et cetera. Um, and so if you have the uh, bus routes in your community, those would be good places for the multifamily or other uh, locations consistent with the Commonwealth Sustainable Development Principles. And that really means in an existing downtown, a rural center, uh, an area of existing commercial or residential development would be um, uh, the best places for the district in if there is no transit station. But again, there are it's not there are no requirements for 50 contiguous acres, you're allowed to break it up into um, smaller, uh, uh, smaller locational areas. Uh, next slide. And here I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Clark Ziegler. Thanks, Chris. Um, I just want to talk for a minute about technical assistance that's will be that is being made available to communities to help uh, comply with the new law and the Best way to frame that conversation is to start by looking at density um, for a couple of reasons. One is there are a lot of public misperceptions about what different levels of housing density look like and what already exists in um, people's own communities. Um, and also there are some misunderstandings that we hope to clear up today in many cases about what the proposed guidance requires. Um, if you look at this slide on the right hand side are just a handful of many great examples of existing density of 15 units an acre in the region. and I should point out that almost every one of the 175 communities in the district already has some existing multifamily housing with very few exceptions uh, at, at the density 15 units per acre required by the new law. On the left is a graphic that just illustrates uh, some of the various kinds of housing types that could be combined to achieve a density, uh, mixed and matched to achieve a density of 15 units per acre. And I think one of the things we hope you hear loud and clear today is that the uh, draft guidance was intended to give communities flexibility to adapt zoning districts to unique local situations. You know, the layout of every community is different. The location of every you know, transit station where they exist is different relative to downtowns, relative to commercial areas. And we understand that. And, and the, the intention here is to, is to uh, uh, enforce the law, the, law, the law as it's written and what the legislature intended while also giving communities flexibility to do what's best uh, in each case locally to, to achieve the best results. Next slide, please. Um, I think it's really important. I'm gonna talk about uh, a dedicated program that the Massachusetts Housing Partnership uh, is standing up to um, support uh, the new law. And, and Chris in a minute, we'll talk about some of what other agencies are doing as well. Um, I think it's really important to, to reinforce, You know, when the secretary talked about uh, this new law being good housing, transportation and climate policy, um, that's reflected in the way that state agencies have, co have collaborated up to this point in developing the draft guidance and are collaborating in uh, providing assistance to communities. This is a shared objective for the Commonwealth, for the region. Um, frankly, it's an objective for most cities and towns to promote, to promote ha affor ha housing affordability, to give people more mobility options, um, to, you know, to address climate change. And this, this new law does all of those things. And for that reason, we're seeing tremendous cooperation um, across state government from not just from housing and economic development, but from energy and environmental affairs, from MassDOT. Uh, we're very much on all on the same page in trying to make this successful and try, trying to provide as much help to communities as possible. Uh, on our end, uh, our technical assistance program has uh, four basic elements. The first is a series of how-to webinars that we'll be launching shortly, some of them prior to the guidance being the, the uh, guidance being finalized and probably most of them right after. 
Um, the second, we are, we'll be providing third-party technical assistance, expert consultants to work with individual cities and towns to help identify opportunities to create districts that comply with the law or to determine uh, in some cases that communities are already in compliance with a new law. Third, uh, which is already well underway, is an information online information clearinghouse to help communities um, understand what resources are available um, and what both both understand the guidance the guidance in the law itself, but also what what resources are available um, in support. And the fourth and uh, kind of exciting one for for us is a number of digital tools. Uh, we have been working. Our Center for Housing Data has been putting together a database of every residential parcel, not just in the MBTA region, actually in the entire Commonwealth, that allows uh, any user, no, not an expert, you know, any local citizen or local official, uh, to uh, look at a map, drill down at the community level, at the neighborhood level, at the street level, and look at all existing, visualize all existing housing density, and even do calculations about in particular areas of a community, what the existing densities are. So we think that's a great uh, great thing to help folks really have an understanding of what density already exists and where. Um, and then we will be supplementing, we hope to supplement that later this spring with a uh, desktop digital tool that will allow communities to do what-if scenarios to draw potential district boundaries to comply with the new law and sort of and do a calculation of how many housing units uh, that new zoning district would support. So uh, we think it's we're, we're excited. We don't we don't want to make this exercise any more difficult than it needs to be, and we're we're happy to be developing some new tools that we think will really um, support a good local decision making um, as as the law takes effect. Um, and then just a, a final comment. Um, I think we understand that there are really two elements of of um, getting this law implemented. One of them is very technical, simply figuring out, you know, what districts al allow, you know, what housing and what locations, and understanding how that how that matches up with the yield, with the requirements of the, of the state guidance. But the other, honestly, is a, is a lowercase p political challenge of getting local approval for zoning changes, which are, you know, not any for those of you who are local officials, you know really well, uh, zoning changes are not, are not easy to accomplish. And even with the new housing cho choice law and the lower margin of approval, you still need an affirmative city or town council or town meeting vote to make zoning changes. And we, we understand that's a lift. This is something new. Um, community, you know, local folks will need some convincing to make changes in local zoning. And we get that. And we want to be as helpful as we can be to you as you sort of craft a local strategy and then communicate about that strategy to your local residents. So uh, we're excited to get that process underway. And with that, I will turn it back to Chris. Thanks, Clark. Important reminders. So um, the bottom half of this slide talks about some of the Commonwealth's uh, grant programs that are going to support a compliance effort for communities. Um, and this will be starting with fiscal 23. Uh, I run three different grant programs, the Housing Choice Grant, Community Planning Grants, and Rural and Small Town Development Fund. Um, those will all support um, uh, compliance, and those are part of the community one stop. That application period is open now, and then the submittal period is during the month of May, uh, and those grants get awarded um, this winter, so they're timely. Uh, we expect that that will continue for the next several years because this is not just a one year uh, compliance uh, effort, it's going to go on for the next several years. Um, we're also working with our colleagues at the Ener uh, Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Their land use grant programs will um, prioritize MBTA municipalities and we'll be coordinating that. We're working closely with the regional planning agencies. There are actually seven regional planning agencies with um, uh, MBTA communities. Uh, most of those are in the MAPC, um, but we're working closely with them as they prioritize DLTA funding and other technical assistance funding. It is our goal to try and provide assistance to any one of the 175 communities that wants assistance. Uh, and again, that's going to be over um, uh, the next several years. Uh, and we're continuing to reach out to other uh, agencies and, uh, uh, and other sources um, to supplement um, the, these grant programs. Uh, next slide. 
I did mention at the beginning that there are some requirements this year, uh, and one of those uh, explicitly in order for all MBTA communities to remain eligible for this year's Housing Choice and MassWorks grant programs, um, we uh, require that communities submit um, in a community information form. That's an online form available on our website that asks for some pretty basic information about what people think about their existing zoning, what kind of technical assistance they need, uh, and then um, to provide evidence that they've had a briefing uh, about the um, guidelines at their uh, select board, city council, or town council. Uh, and we tried to make that as simple as possible. Uh, and those are all due on May 2nd. Next slide. So just a quick overview of the, the timelines here. Uh, December 15th, we released the guidelines. We're close to the end here on March 31st where the public comment period ends. Again, that's an online comment form that's available at mass.gov backslash MBTA communities. Um, the May 2nd is the deadline for the community information form. Uh, and then the rest of these dates are in the draft guidelines, but they outline that um, communities provide an action plan to us by the end of this calendar year, or if they think that they comply, that they are going to submit um, a compliance uh, determination application. All of these forms will be online um, and will be developed and, and available um, as soon as the final guidelines are out. And then there's a, a DHCD has some deadlines to approve those action plans, and then the deadline for um, uh, subway and bus communities communities to adopt their zoning amendments um, as presented in the draft guidelines is the end of calendar year 2023. And then the commuter rail and adjacent communities have another year um, out to 2024. Uh, again, those are the, the timelines that the draft guidelines um, uh, put forward. And so if you have comments or, or thoughts about those, um, please do submit them in, in a public comment form. Um, next slide. And I'm going to turn it back to the secretary. Oh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Clark. I'll wrap it up very briefly here. We're in the middle of this uh, stakeholder engagement process. The guidelines, draft guidelines come out December 15th. We're going to wrap this up this week. We've done, I think, as mentioned, about 19 of these sessions so far. It's been very helpful for us. Um, and the final guidelines will be issued sometime after uh, March 31. And the thinking now is that the deadline for having a compliant zoning district uh, will be 2023 for subway and bus communities and 2024 for commuter rail uh, in the adjacent communities. Next. Uh, and finally, encourage folks to go visit mass.gov MBTA communities. There's a lot of information there. It's got the draft guidelines. It has how to comply in 2022, opportunities for public comment, access to the technical assistance resources, uh, and, and much, much more. So um, that's our presentation for today. I'll, I'll leave in a, a minute or so here and let you get on to Q&A with, with Chris and Clark and others. Uh, but maybe just two points to, to uh, leave you with. One is um, we are in the middle of a housing crisis. And our lack of housing production in the last 30 years has put us in this position. It impacts our households and families, impacts our communities, and impacts our ability to compete economically. So we got to get after this one in a big way and start producing a lot more housing. Uh, and secondly, we, uh, while this is a mandate, uh, we approach this in a spirit of partnership. We recognize it's new, it's complicated, and we are here to help communities uh, understand the guidelines and ultimately to comply with them and, and together continue to tackle this housing crisis. So big thanks to Jason and Stephanie for bringing us together today. The team will uh, very capably answer your questions. Look forward to uh, our ongoing dialogue about housing in Massachusetts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. On behalf of the partnership of the Middlesex Three Coalition, thank you to you and to Chris and to Clark for your presentation this morning. Excited to get underway with Q&A and just uh, uh, for our folks who uh, are, are with us this morning, you are welcome to utilize either the Q&A or the chat function uh, to go ahead and, and type questions. We will read them aloud uh, to our panelists. Uh, we're going to start with one from Rachel Benson from the town of Rentham, uh, which uh, I, I know is a, a, a touch outside the scope of this guidance, but certainly is something that uh, I know a lot of our stakeholders will, will like heard. And you know, Rachel had asked, would there be any other legislation proposed that would increase MBTA or RTA services to the adjacent communities? Uh, and I think that question sort of gets to um, you know, how you, when you have adjacent communities, they don't necessarily have the level of, of public transportation service that some of the communities with stations do. So, you know, I'll turn it over to Chris or Clark for any comment on that. But maybe, um, Chris, if, if you wanted to add into that, uh, I know the guidance also includes some specificity on what you might consider uh, for adjacent communities uh, in lieu of, of the station itself. And this might be a good place to, to emphasize that a little bit. <laughs> 
Sure, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, I, I can't comment actually, or I can't respond to whether the tea is going to increase service in those areas. I'm not. I'm not from the tea. I don't re represent them. Um, I, what I do recognize is that some of those adjacent communities do have service from other regional trans uh, transportation authorities or RTAs in the uh, transportation acronym land. Uh, and so um, one of the things I think I, I mentioned, and that if you do have service um, from one of those, that uh, that bus route, if that's a bus route, may be a good place to locate your multifamily district because it does have transit service. Uh, the legislation explicitly references MBTA transit facilities such as fixed route transit, um, but if you do have those bus routes, um, those might be a good place as well. And I think my overall um, kind of response is that the communities that are adjacent are relatively proximate um, to take advantage of the um, Commonwealth's uh, transportation infrastructure. And so some of this is about um, having to do the fair share uh, of uh, communities that are near or, or have uh, MBTA stations um, and, and, and are you know, the beneficiaries of that, of that infrastructure, you know, millions of dollars of infrastructure um, to provide uh, transportation services. Um, Clark, do you wanna add anything? Uh, no, I, I think I think you got it, and I, and I think I think it's the right question. I think long term, you know, this is this is a regional imperative that we get more people out of single, you know, the, more people using alternative means of transportation. And I think, I think on, honestly, if we do a better job aligning our development pattern with with the existing transportation network, I think that will result that will inevitably result in a stronger, uh, better utilized, and probably better better funded transit system. So I think I think it's all headed in the right in the same direction. Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, we're going to jump between the, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we had a question from Bill Scully in the chat. Uh, you had mentioned that some grants will be held back uh, from communities who don't approve the new zoning or who or presumably don't come into compliance. Could you elaborate a little bit on the grants or the funding that might be held back for non-compliance? Sure, Bill, uh, happy to answer that. It's right in the law, actually, uh, and that it specifies if you're not in compliance with the guidelines, you're not eligible to receive MassWorks, which is a major infrastructure uh, a program that the state runs every year. It's approximately $80 million a year that is given out to communities for a whole variety of infrastructure, whether it's new roads, new traffic lights, sewer, water, uh, other kinds of infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure. Um, so that's a, a major grant program. It is the state's major grant uh, infrastructure major infrastructure grant program. Uh, and then there are the housing choice grant program, which is uh, capital dollars for communities that have been designated as housing choice communities. The legislation also mentions the local capital projects fund, and that's not actually a grant program. Um, what I can reflect is that for the last several years, uh, that has been appropriated by the legislature. Uh, it is revenues from um, the resort casinos, um, from the Gaming Act, uh, and it has been appropriated for the last several years by the legislature in support of the operating um, budget for public housing authorities. Um, so that's what I can reflect what has happened in the past. I, you know, since the legislature appropriates that budget every year, I don't know what they're going to do for fiscal 23, but it has made, it's about $8 million and it has made up about 10% of the public housing authorities operating budget. I know that's a kind of vague answer, but that's just what it is. Thank you. Going to go back to the Q and A. We've got a bit of a, a long one here, so I'm going to try to tighten it up a little bit. Uh, this this the uh, questioner asked: the state is working on tools uh, that are designed to provide insight about uh, what density is already in existence and where. Uh, but uh, th this is still being developed. Is it reasonable to expect that the prescriptive requirements could become more nuanced to minimize the impact uh, on existing communities, uh, i.e., reducing the gross density requirement for smaller population communities? I'll let Clark talk about the tool, but um, we cannot change the 15 units per acre. That's in the statute. Um, so that's a basic thing that we, you know, the guidelines cannot change. Um, we, the guidelines can do other things, um, such as talk about um, the reasonable size and is that different? We can talk, uh, timelines can be different, um, but we cannot change the 15 units uh, uh, per acre. Go ahead, Clark. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I guess, I guess a couple of comments. Uh, 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 one is that it zoning is a long term, you know, for, you know zoning is a, has a long term impact, and just be, you know, just because um, uh, you know zoning is in place, it doesn't mean that 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 housing or any other use will will be developed. So I think we see, I think 
I think any any concern about the the level of impact on individual communities or types of communities is absolutely fair game during the public comment period. And I think uh, we would love to hear from folks about what they consider reasonable, achievable uh, for various types of communities. This is the time to make those public comments. But I will say in a lot of cases, it may be a little intimidating to think, you know, wow, the zoning could in theory allow this many housing units in my community. Um, that's not typically something that happens over one or two years. That's something that is typically happens over 10 or 20 years. Um, it takes quite a lot to build housing, to make it feasible, to acquire land. Um, and so I think, uh, I think in many respects, what looked like, what may look to some communities like, like daunting um, uh, yield, you know, housing yield requirements may actually be uh, pretty reasonable if you really step back and look at, look at the pace at which development typically happens. Thank you. And I had a question shot directly to me, which I think is a good one. Uh, and that's about parking requirements. Obviously, the law uh, and the guidance are designed uh, to, to make the multifamily by right. And there's some specificity in there around what, what a municipality cannot do uh, in an attempt to, to block a project. But of course, uh, some cities and towns, many cities and towns have minimum parking requirements uh, for certain types of development. Do Does either the law or the guidance uh, address parking requirements, and what are your thoughts vis-a-vis -vis how those requirements might impact uh, the creation of, of projects and units? Want me to start, Chris, and then you can jump Go in? Go ahead. Sure. Um, I think uh, there's, there's, there's two issues here. One is in just trying to ask one of the, one of the technical challenges uh, in determining whether communities are complying is looking at a zone district and doing some general calculations about how much housing could, could be developed in a particular district. And that's, that's an exercise we're actually sort of piloting right now. And that requires some assumptions about, you know, about how tall buildings are, what, what, you know, lot, you know, what, what setbacks there are. And parking is one of those things that, that imposes a sort of a physical requirement on a parcel of land in order to build housing. So we're going to have to make some assumptions. We, meaning all the agencies looking at this methodology, are going to have to make some general assumptions about sort of what level of parking uh, is required, and then how that affects the ability. You know, how many how many units that that would would make possible in a particular district? Um, having said that, I think we would strong a number of communities um, have been, especially near transit, have been uh, uh, recently dialing back, or in some cases eliminating uh, off street parking requirements where there are really good transit options nearby. And I think that, as a matter of policy, is a very positive thing. I think. Different communities are approaching that different, you know, certainly that's a, at this point more of an urban phenomenon than suburban and smaller town. Um, but I think, I think it's a, it's a fair question. You know, I think, I think communities should be asking themselves, you know, what level of parking requirements really are reasonable and, and how much of this parking that we're requiring people, people to, to provide for is actually being used um, and in many cases is underutilized. And if I can just, so the law, just to answer the question directly, the law does not mention parking uh, as one of the things that, you know, is regulated. The guidelines, the draft guidelines currently do not uh, reference parking, but what Clark is saying is it's it's interwoven in the in the unit capacity, right? And it will be, it could potentially affect unit capacity. Some of the uh, universal resources that Clark mentioned that um, just to point out that we'll might be developing that will help communities is uh, may possibly like model bylaws, model model ordinances, and those will kind of lead with the um, uh, the appropriate fit for parking. Uh, and so, speaking of appropriate fit for parking, if you are interested in parking um, regulations and, and and how they work and how they play out, um, MAPC, the Regional Planning Agency for the Boston area, has a really good report. I believe they did it in 2018 or 2019. It's called Perfect Fit Parking. They looked at actual parking use usage and utilization in 200 actual multifamily developments and found that most parking is not used. Uh, and so, it's a really interesting report. Um, with actual data and all, you know on the ground, um, like you know counting of how many um, spaces were being used. So if you are interested in that, you might check their website and look for perfect fit parking. It's a very interesting and compelling study. Thank you, Chris and Clark, and uh, back to the chat for for two questions from Sue Templeton. Then what we'll take together. Um, there are obviously several uh, communities with uh, currently three thousand total homes or less. Do you feel the seven hundred fifty minimum capacity is reasonable? 
And then so, you know, sort of related to that, you know, it, it's obviously potentially a big political lift in these communities. Um, is two years uh, a reasonable time frame, especially if 10 to 20 years might be sort of a, a more realistic development horizon? Yeah, well, thank you, Susan, for your for your your question. And really, I'd say that's a that's a comment, right? And so we have been hearing from small communities in the public comments, uh, and I would encourage you um, to put forward not not what I think, but what do you think? What is reasonable to you? And if you don't think that that minimum um, is reasonable for your community, you should please let us know. Uh, and the same for the timeline. Um, you know, the public comments are about you know anything that's in the draft guidelines, the transit category you know, section 5.8 point sub I, uh, you know, whatever it is, if you have an opinion about the, um, the draft guidelines, the reason that they're draft is for us to get to get feedback. So I would just encourage you to, uh, to submit a comment if you think that that's not reasonable, uh, either one of those um, criteria is not reasonable. Thank you, Chris, and, and back to the Q&A. Uh, will MassWorks grants be subject to compliance starting in 2023, 2024, or will those lag the housing choice grants? Um, I try and answer as straightforwardly as I can because I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I'm reading it so, as a and I'm going to talk about fiscal years here. And now I'm going to talk about fiscal years and calendar years. So get ready. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're in calendar year 22. Um, the mat, the applications in the community one stop, which I mentioned is mass works and housing choice, which have an application that gets submitted in the month of May of this year. Those are for fiscal 23 grants or what we call fiscal 23. So fiscal 23 will start on July one of this year. Um, and so that's uh, when they affect and there are requirements. Uh, the only requirement this year is for communities to submit that community information form. Uh, and so we'll be working closely and continuing to send reminders to people to, to get those community information forms in um, by May 2nd. Uh, and so um, that is uh, when we are starting with this year's or fiscal 23's grants. I hope that is helpful for folks. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we do have another question uh, uh, regarding links uh, to, to the community density information, uh, and I'll actually take that one. We're gonna endeavor to, in our follow-up email to registrants this morning, provide links to all of the uh, services and reports that have been referenced during the presentation. Uh, but to, 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 to throw in another question, uh, Chris and Clark, uh, wondering if you can elaborate uh, a little bit on some of the extenuating circumstances that might be considered. And I know obviously you, you, you're not able to, to say definitively one way uh, or the other, but uh, you know, for example, um, we do have some communities uh, that do not host uh, the commuter rail station, but are rather adjacent, uh, and have expressed to us concern regarding a lack of other resources related uh, to that station. So, for example, they're 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 within the 0.5 miles from the station, but there might not be access to sidewalks, grocery mm -hmm. stores, uh, mm -hmm. other types of public transportation. It might not be served to the town on the on the RTA is would would those represent an, an example of something that might be considered as an extenuating circumstance where the adjacent town just isn't offering the types of services that one might associate with walkable development yeah that's a good question and it's a complicated one right um uh, and and part of this is i mean so while we are crafting the guidelines and attempt to you know under, uh, be flexible but yet you know um, implement the law um we do understand that on the ground um you, you may have adjacent area, but it's uh, got uh, full of wetlands or a cemetery or a park, uh, for example, that's just not the right location or does not have transportation connections, is not easily accessible. Um, so at some point, um, what these will be is a case by case review. Uh, and I guess that's you know when we come up with the final guidelines, again, we're trying to uh, pr uh, provide that fle uh, some flexibility and understanding for things that happen on the ground um, and, Perhaps we'll try and give some examples of that or, you know, in some of our, maybe not the guidelines themselves, but in our, so we'll be doing this again when the guidelines are final, we're going to be coming at, back out and talking to people. Uh, and, and in that case, we'll be trying to give some examples about, you know, what we mean when we say unusual circumstances. Um, but at some level, Jason, um, this is, it, it will be a case by case review. Every compliance application is a case by case review. And we, you know, are staff, staffed up to, uh, to do that kind of case by case review. I would just add to that. I think the statute is is very explicit about the half mile. So I think so I think we're 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 trying to to on what you know honor the letter of the law, but also to recognize that there are there are unique local circumstances that 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 vary every place you go. And 
Um, I know we and, and Chris also have had some what if conversations with a number of communities and and in a lot of cases, there's a way to strike a balance because of the flexibility in the district not being not necessarily having to be a single, you know, monolithic district, allowing it to be split up. The number of communities we've been talking to have found ways to do to do things that are very much within that within the the half mile statutory requirement, and then do other complementary multifamily districts that that fit elsewhere in the community, either in a, in a commercial you know, commercial district or other sort of appropriate locations. So I think the, the the challenge here is to do is to do what the law requires, but also have as much common sense as we can bring to the table around how communities can make decisions locally to uh, to align not just with the station, but also with other sort of uh, other strong local planning objectives. And excuse, excuse me, Jason, I just want to Go add ahead. a little bit. One of the things we have not yet mentioned, and I just typically we do find a place to mention that um, these districts, in addition to not necessarily needing to be that 50 contiguous acres, don't also have to be monolithic. We do expect that- You're getting to the next will... question that was just sent okay. to me about some districts. <laughs> okay, well, good. I'm, I'm, I, my ears were burning. Go right ahead. Um, we do expect that there could be, I mean, it's not mandatory, but it could be that you might have one portion, of, you would have a sub-district that would have a higher density than 15 units an acre and another portion of a district that might have a lower density. What um, the guidelines specify, the draft guidelines specify is that it has to be this, you know, kind of uh, 15 units across the entire multifamily district, um, but there might be various densities um, throughout. And I just wanted to take the opportunity. This, this question seemed to be a good place to mention that. Excellent, thank you. And I've got to, one more question that was sent directly to me. I'll note to folks, we've got about seven minutes left. If you've got to, additional questions, go ahead and throw them into the Q&A. Uh, but uh, Chris, wondering if, if you were, and or Clark talk a little bit about the use of overlay districts and a question sent to me uh, about overlay districts and that needing to be 25 contiguous acres of land and looking like the law said 50 contiguous. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, about overlay districts and, and the 25 versus the 50? Sure. And this is, I'm going to um, just make a suggestion that folks, we put out the draft guidelines and then we've issued frequently asked questions. And in fact, we've updated those frequently asked questions. And this is a case where one of the frequently asked questions actually made a, uh, a reflection on that section, um, which uh, in the draft guidelines, we do talk about, um, it, it's actually, I, I think it's section five, it's talking about the um, that where we can you can do less than 50 contiguous acres and the draft guidelines were written to reference overlay districts um, because you know we were thinking about overlay districts and being clear that it didn't have to be 50 contiguous one one portion of the multifamily district has to have 25 contiguous acres in the draft guidelines and then but other portions of that multifamily district can be as low as five acre areas um, again, the draft guidelines in that section uses the term overlay district. So like a 40R district or a transit oriented district, you know, there's overlay districts lie on top of base districts. In the frequently asked questions, we did clarify that uh, while we said overlay districts, we mean <laughs> base districts or overlay districts. So any kind of multifamily district that is established would have that same locational flexibility. Um, so I hope that's kind of maybe where the confusion is or what, what, what the question is getting to. And I do appreciate that the guidelines are 11 single space pages and then the frequently asked questions is more uh, detail, but really you will find um, some clarifications. We've acknowledged, you know, there were some typos and errors. Um, we're trying to add clarification uh, through the frequently asked questions. So um, I would just encourage you, uh, you know, in your spare time to, to take a look at those as well. Great, thank you. And we have a question uh, in the q and I'm gonna read it as, as is, and I might actually clarify it a little bit. Uh, the question as, as written is, uh, it sounds like existing use of land such as commercial, retail, industrial, if included in the district, would still count towards the gross density potential as long as the total combined areas of the district was at least 50 acres in size. Uh, I, I think the questioner might be getting at it if, if other uses uh, of the land are gonna be considered in calculating the density. And, and if this, you know, if this is explicitly residential, a density that's that's for your calculation, Chris. Is that correct? Well, Chris, thanks. Go ahead, Clark. Let me, let me yeah, jump go ahead. Yeah. I think I think in many cases in the region, you know, this is this is an, a largely built out region. Um, there will be existing uses uh, that we're not talking about for cornfields for the most part here, although that, that may be the case, you know, in some communities. But for the most part, we're talking about. 
zoning uh, uh, on land that is already developed for some purpose. And I think in a lot of cases, what's sort of typical, honestly, with multifamily development around transit is sort of low intensity commercial industrial uses that are really no longer uh, particularly economically viable um, being converted to, to residential development is probably the most typical pattern. So I, th I would say in, in many, if not most cases, uh, zoning districts uh, will will encompass some existing unit uses that may be residential, they may be multifamily, but they may be, they could be almost anything else. And I think that's where the sort of the long-term impact comes in. I think, I think developing multifamily housing requires assembling land, it requires economic feasibility, it requires a number of things. I think about my own community, you know, we have some some commercial uses literally right at our, our commuter rail station that may not be viable long term, uh, that maybe, you know, at some point really might make sense to become residential. But that's that's, you know, that's that's a long term play here. So I think I think I think the expectation, at least in our minds, is that in most cases, these districts will have will will be built out in some fashion already. And it's a question of what what redevelopment potential may exist at some future date. And I think the only thing that I would add to that is just, you know, the, the um, bylaw would have to allow for the multifamily at the certain densities, you know, to show that the capacity could be met, um, but there may be other uses that are allowed. And again, that's that, you know, it could be a base district that just allows a whole bunch of different kinds of things uh, without creating non-conforming uses, or it could be an overlay district that just says, you know, and in addition here, you get multifamily by right at certain densities. So. Great. So 958, we're going to go to our last question, which is submitted by Catherine Perry. I'm going to read it as written. There can be a big difference between density at the development site level and at the zoning district level, which includes existing roads, et cetera. Can you confirm that the densities of your illustrations meet the 15 per acre rule when half the perimeter roads are included? That one stumps me a little bit. I understand where it's coming from. So just let me, I'm gonna start and then I'll let Clark, um, just, yeah. just to clear to be clear to everybody who may not follow, it's a good, really good technical question. The statute uses the term gross density. Um, gross density means uh, all, you know, if there are roads that are adjacent uh, or internal roads in an area that those are included in the denominator. Um, and so the density may be a little higher uh, because you have more land uh, in the denominator. Typically in most planning, um, net density is what is used. And I think the question is getting at, um, are those net density or is that gross density? Um, again, we are limited by the statute in the statute defined gross density. And that's what we have to put forward. And that is what we have to measure. Um, so having said that, uh, just to kind of <laughs> clarify the question, Clark, do you wanna- I'll stick, I'll, stick with, I'll stick with your answer on that one. <laughs> Great. So with uh, our last minute, uh, Chris, I'm going to have you just maybe close us out and then, then I'll just uh, with, I'll offer some closing words. But if you just want to close us out with a quick reminder of uh, timeline and next steps for this process. Sure. Thank you. So uh, today's the 28th of March. Um, the public comment period will close. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's 5 p.m. Or, or, or midnight on the 31st, um, but please do get your comments in as soon as possible. You can find that at mass.gov backslash MBTA communities. There's a lot of stuff on that website, but one of those, uh, there's a table of contents with a link right to the online form where you can submit and upload public comments. Um, so please do attend to that right away. And then the community information forms are due uh, close of business on May 2nd. Well, with that, on behalf of the 495 Metro West Partnership and the Middlesex 3 Coalition, I want to thank our presenters for taking the time this morning to discuss this important topic with our stakeholders and to answer our questions. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees this morning for taking the time to be here and for your thoughtful questions as well. We will be doing a follow-up email with a copy of the slide deck utilized, uh, as well as some links to some resources referenced. Uh, just a reminder, as Chris just noted, uh, DHCD is accepting public comment on the compliance gui guidance through Thursday the 31st. First, uh, again, this coming Thursday, we will include in our follow-up email uh, a link which you can utilize to offer your comments. And of course, if you're interested in becoming more involved in the 495 Metro West Partnership or the Middlesex 3 Coalition, we invite you to visit our websites, 495partnership.org and or middlesex3.com to learn more about us and to join our email list. So with that, thank everyone for joining us today and have a great day. Thanks.